Good morning. Good morning. Happy Palm Sunday to you. Thank you. Enjoy the sunshine as it rains upon you. How many you know that on April 9th, 1865, Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant, the Union Army, at the village of Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. The surrender ended the bloodiest war ever fought on American soil. State against state, brother against brother. It was a conflict that really tore the nation apart. It was five days later, Good Friday, April 14th, 1865, America's most revered president, Abraham Lincoln, was shot and mortally wounded by John Wilkes Booth in Ford's Theater. It was Lincoln who wrote the Emancipation Proclamation ended slavery in the U.S. forever. It was Lincoln who wrote and gave the Gettysburg Address. <coughs> Lincoln hated this war, but he was drawn into it because he believed it was the only way to save the nation. On Palm Sunday, the war ended. Triumph. On Good Friday, Abraham Lincoln became the first U.S. president to be assassinated. Tragedy. Welcome to Holy Week. Welcome to the triumph and tragedy of the six days preceding Easter. That's the kind of world we live in. A triumphant end to a terrible war on Sunday and a tragic slate of a great leader who brought us through the war on Friday. One moment we're on top, the next we're on the bottom. So let's move forward in history. Now the year 1942. First American troops are marching in London. We, we end the conflict now known as World War II. The people of London are cheering the American soldiers, and the friendly reception exhilarates the young soldiers, and they sing as they march. Suddenly the troops turn into a, the main street, and a strange hush falls over the scene. The happy songs die on their lips. So you're now looking for the first time upon an area of London that has been blown to bits. They see the great wounds of the city inflicted by falling bombs. They suddenly realize the city has suffered terribly. These young soldiers' hearts, one moment celebration, the next great sadness. Life's like that. Celebration and sadness. Triumph and tragedy. Life's difficult. It can be surprising and inevitable. I remind you of the famous first words of Scott Peck's book, The Road Less Traveled. His first words are, Life is difficult. Then he goes on to say the great truth, but most of us can't see it. Instead, we moan more or less insensibly, noisily or subtly, about the, the uh, enormity of our problem. As if life is supposed to be easy for us. And therefore, what has happened to us has never happened to anyone else before. At least not in this excruciatingly painful or insoluble way that it has burdened us. Peck says that he wrote that not because a therapist he hears patients say this, but because he has been tempted to say this himself. He'd call it the law of exceptionalism. The idea that this has never happened before. At least not to the degree that it's happened to me. Exceptional. You know, like the cartoon I saw not long ago showing a, a huge desk and a huge CEO sitting behind it in a large, huge leather chair. Standing meekly in front of this desk is a man in work clothes, obviously a lowly employee of the corporation. And the worker says to the boss, if it's any comfort, it's lonely at the bottom, too. For I remark, life is difficult for everyone. Someone explained to me once that they didn't like Lent. They said, I'm not into suffering. I like that. Like it's an option. Like it's an adopted lifestyle. I don't like suffering. 
Well, Jesus didn't like suffering either. If you read ahead in chapter 26 of Matthew, verse 42, in the Garden of Gethsemane, you remember Christ praying, My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. But when the time came for him to go on, the hero quest, the text says, he says, stay steadfastly for Jerusalem. Scott Hosey shared a, how a pre-concert lecturer, the conductor of a symphony orchestra, was telling the audience about the major work that the orchestra would be performing that evening at the concert. The conductor told the people that if they listened carefully to the music, they would discover that it was both surprising and inevitable. On the one hand, the musical score would take a fair number of rather jarring and unexpected twists. There would be points in the concert when the blare of the trumpet or the sudden rolling of the timpani would seem to come out of nowhere in a surprising fashion. On the other hand, however the conductor noted in the long run, these surprises would themselves become part of a larger coherence. And once the listeners heard the entire piece from start to finish, they'd find the music and an air of inevitability. And how could it ever have been written any other way? Surprising and inevitable. Palm Sunday and the events of Holy Week are both surprising and inevitable. The truth is that we're not completely sure what to make of Palm Sunday. After 40 days of Lenten travel, of often folks on serious and sometimes dark subjects, suddenly we arrive at a day that seems the, at first blush to be surprisingly cheery. The Palm Sunday Parade has, has color and spectacle, cheering and singing, festive voices and joyful exuberance. This seems like a, like a happy day. It would be completely appropriate if you were asked, what in the world is this day doing here, given how close we are to the cross? Is Palm Sunday a, a bright spot in the midst of an otherwise darkened hue of Lent? Are we for just a little while this morning supposed to forget all the things dreary so we can cry out with a full throat, Hosanna? Or is there also a sadness to this day that we have to keep in mind? The triumph, the tragedy, Palm Sunday, Good Friday, life happens. The amazing thing is that happened to the Son of God. Acclaimed on Sunday, crucified on Friday, it's incredible. Didn't they realize who he was? Sure, they gave up, he gave up his divinity when he entered the world as a tiny baby. But couldn't they see his miracles? Didn't he raise Lazarus from the dead? Couldn't they sense he was no ordinary man? He was Messiah, Savior, Redeemer. Sent to the world by the Father to save the world from its sin. How could they miss that? How could they not know? You know, one of the gruesome, or most gruesome, hopeless places in early 19th century England was debtor's prison. Charles Dickens described it, but thousands of England's poor lived it. First hand. Everything that they owned was, was confiscated. Nothing was left. If any debt remained, the debtor was imprisoned until the balance owed was paid, which of course could never be because debtors were locked up. So it's a situation without hope. This is civilized 19th century England, by the way. But according to ancient Jewish law, there were moral limits on what could be demanded in payment of debt. Among those things that were legally off limits was a person's most important piece of clothing, their cloak. Less substantial garments could be held as collateral, but a person's cloak was considered to be in a category all by itself. A cloak offered warmth and protection. It provided modesty, shielding from nakedness. A cloak doubled as, as clothing and shelter. 
function is haberdashery by day and a bedroll by night. You would take a lot in payment for debts, but you could not take the cloak off someone's back. But a cloak could always be offered. Sir Walter Raleigh legendarily swept his cloak off his shoulder and laid it across the mud puddle so the queen's foot would not be damp. In today's gospel text, cloaks were offered for theological, not meteorological reasons. As Jesus prepared to enter in Jerusalem proper, he intentionally changes things up. The Galilean ministry is at an end. The time for keeping a low profile is over. There's a new messianic movement. Jesus announced to the disciples the faith that awaited. The Son of Man once he entered that city of Jerusalem. Jesus crossed in Jerusalem, the Calvary cross already stood before him. If he had consulted his political advisors, they would have been aghast. You know, what was he up to? Leaders are supposed to project strength and power. Here's an example of a different kind of power. Jesus, a young carpenter, riding in Jerusalem on a donkey. His disciples vie for the best seats, and, take, and he takes a towel and basin to wash their feet. On a cross, he meets evil with a prayer of forgiveness. You know, one time Methodist bishop of Mississippi, Jack Metter, tells a wonderful story of an incident that occurred during the Special Olympics. See, nine children are lined up for the 100-yard dash. The gun sounds, and the race was off. Only a few yards into the race, one of the children fell and began to cry. For some reason, these challenged children did not understand the world's concept of competition and getting ahead and taking advantage when a competitor is down. The other eight children stopped, running back, came back to the falling comrade. A young girl with Down syndrome kissed him and brushed him off. And the children lifted him up together. And arm in arm, they ran across the finish line. The audience rose to their feet in applause. There was not one winner that day. There were nine winners. For a fleeting moment, these children showed us what kind of kingdom God is like. They challenge the world's concept that first place is everything. The world says defeating, even destroying one's competitors is the way to go. An example we're seeing today in our world politics. The world says that competition and success is an indisputable law. Competition is toted. On Palm Sunday, and then again in the upper room, and then again on the cross. Jesus challenged the world's concept of power. Jesus wasn't listening to his political advisors when he made answers to Jerusalem that day. He said, listen to the prophet Zechariah. See your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey. Zechariah envisioned the king of kings, the Messiah, coming not on a great stallion, but riding on a humble donkey. And so Matthew highlights Jesus as a peaceable Messiah. One who is gentle or humble. And Jesus has described himself in this way in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. Zechariah foresaw it. Jesus fulfilled it. You know, people often speak of donkeys in belittling terms. You may have heard the expression, I'm just someone who has to do all the donkey work. Or so-and-so is as stubborn as a mule. You'll be a part donkey. These things overlook the contributions of a truly valuable animal. Donkeys have been serving the human race for thousands of years. They were once prized as symbols of humility, gentleness, and peace. In the biblical days, a donkey that had never been ridden was regarded as especially suitable for religious purposes. So it's most fitting that Jesus sent for a cult to perform the royal task of carrying him into Jerusalem. How edible was that donkey's mission? How like our mission as Jesus followers? A Chinese missionary called herself the Lord's donkey. She's a humble believer. 
carrying the Lord faithfully into town after town, training others to do likewise. The Lord has need of many such donkeys in the world today. Humble people who will carry him into their Jerusalem and make him known. You know, the donkey had to be untied before Jesus could use it. We too must be released from the worldly attachments if we're to serve Christ. But are we willing to be the Lord's donkeys in this day and age? Jesus chose, chooses to embody the image of a humble king, a meek Messiah. Right on, small, simple donkey. Jesus moves into Jerusalem with the obedience and the humility. Symbolically, his back is already bare, re ready for the cruelties and sacrifice to the way. Whenever I read the account of Palm Sunday, I remember how the event is depicted in one of my favorite movies from 1973, <laughs> Jesus Christ Superstar. You remember that? I even have the album. So a moment. In that movie, the Palm Sunday crowd sings, remember, Christ, I know you, I love you. you know I love you. Do you see me? I wave. Remember that song? You can't get from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday, though, without going through Good Friday. Before Jesus could be resurrected, he had to die. That same crowd that threw their cloaks and palm branches on the road, that same crowd shouted Hosanna to Jesus on Palm Sunday, the same crowd that sang, Christ, you know I love you, did you see me, I wave, are the same people who before one week will have passed or realize that Jesus is not exactly the kind of Messiah they wanted. And before the week's out, they'll turn against Jesus and demand his death. Those who sang their sweet hosannas on Palm Sunday were shouting, crucify him, crucify, crucify him, on Good Friday. Can you imagine disappointment? Jesus felt as he looked into the face of the people around him. The crowds who would shout hosanna one moment and crucify him the next. Disappointment is his disciples, one of whom betrayed him. His most trusted who would deny him. And the three closest to him, who would, wouldn't even stay awake and on the job when he agonized over the cup the Father had set before him. Can you imagine the hurt he must have felt within? So Alexander McKenzie is a Canadian hero, an early fur trader and explorer. He accomplished a magnificent feat when he led his expedition across Canada from Fort Chippewa uh, on Lake uh, Athabasca to the Pacific Ocean. His incredible journey was completed in 1793, 11 years before Lewis and Clark began their famous expedition of the West. Mackenzie's earlier attempt in 1789, however, had been a major disappointment. His explorers set out in an effort to find a water route to the city. The valiant group followed the mighty river, now named Mackenzie, with high hopes, paddling furiously amid great dangers. Fortunately, it didn't empty into excuse me, it didn't empty the Pacific. It empty into the Arctic Ocean. In his diary, Mackenzie called it the river of disappointment. Jesus was now face to face with his river of disappointment. He knew it, it would end like this. But still it's hard to stifle the, the will to believe. The hope that things will turn out better than expected. Triumph and tragedy. Palm Sunday, Good Friday. The crowds turned their back on the Son of God. The obvious question is, would it be any different today? Would we welcome Christ into our community, into our family, even into our church? It's a selling question, but it needs to be asked. Fleming Rutledge, in her book, The Bible in the New York Times, tells the story of a woman in her church who would not come to church on Palm Sunday. Evidently, they, they, the church would reenact the scene in Pilate's courtyard on Palm Sunday. The woman can't, couldn't stand being asked to shout, Crucify him! Crucify him! She said, I just can't do it. Rutgers says, 
I always felt very sad for her. She had missed the whole point. She could have come to church every other Sunday of the year, and she still would have missed the whole point. It was very important to her to think of herself as one of the righteous. She could not confront her own darkness. How sad this is. If she but knew it, there is great power in the act of repentance. Can we confront our own darkness? Can we confront our own need for repentance? Will we welcome Christ into our world? We see Christ, the real Christ, comes as a disturber, an unsettler, almost as an as a, uh, anarchist. Think of the things we buy. Status, power, money, image. How does all this square with this humble figure riding on a donkey? Not very well. Look at our popular heroes. I'm thinking about those action-type movie people preferred by most males. Blowing things up. <coughs> avenging past wrongs. Asserting dominance over their foes. Again, reconcile these images of a humble figure riding on a donkey. Do you understand what it means to say Jesus is Lord? It means that we need to examine our lives, examine our goals, examine what it is that we are living for, and ask ourselves, is it enough? Is this really the meaning of life? Or is there more? Is there an eternal, an eternal dom uh, dimension of life that calls us toward the heroic? Holy Week should, should be the time of increased reflection and subsequent repentance as we measure our lives for the Lord's life and death. Triumph and a tragedy. Palm Sunday. Good Friday. Life happens. The amazing thing is it also happened with the Son of God. Would it be any different today? Of course not. Let's be too critical of Jerusalem. Ask yourself this question. What city today would not be shaken by Jesus entering into it? Imagine Jesus entering New York City, Belgrade, Washington, D.C., or even Dayton, Englewood, or any other city around here. I'm sure we'd all welcome him. We'd like any other town. We'd sing our Hosannas at first. We'd line the streets. Strike up the band and have a grand parade down Main Street. I'm equally sure that by the end of the week, we'd nail him to a cross too. And why? Because the kingdom Jesus came to establish still threatens the kingdom of this world. Your kingdom and mine. The kingdom of greed. The kingdom of power. The kingdom of lust. Rule is of grace, mercy and peace in this world. And who among us really wants to surrender our lives to that kingdom and that king? But here's what we must see. While the cross of Christ reveals the evil humanity is capable of, it also reveals the love of which God is capable of. Ultimately, the story of Holy Week is one of triumph and tragedy. Then triumph once again. Not only because of Easter Sunday, but because of Christ's victory over sin and death on Calvary. This is why the cross is so precious to believers. It calls us to repentance. It also calls us to represent God's grace, which covers all our sins, even our most grievous sins. You know, a number of years ago, New York Magazine carried a story of a memorial service for Hubert Humphrey former Vice President of the United States. Hundreds of people came from all over the world to say goodbye to their old friend and colleague. But one person who came was shown and ignored virtually everyone there. Nobody wanted to talk to him. Nobody even looked at him, much less spoke to him. 
That person was former President Richard Nixon. Not long before he'd gone through the shame and infamy of Watergate, he was back in Washington now for the first time since resignation from the presidency. Then a very special thing happened, perhaps the only thing that could even have made a difference in broken the ice. Brother Jimmy Carter, who was in the White House at the time, came into the room, and before he, he was seated, he, he saw Nixon over against the wall all by himself. He went over to him, and as, as though he were greeting a phantom member, stuck out his hand to the former president, smiled broadly. To the surprise of everyone there, the two of them embraced each other. Carter said, Welcome home, Mr. President. Welcome home. One president to another. From different parties. They understood that they had, had what they had in common, what burden they had borne in common. <clears throat> they were elected presidents. And coming on that, Newsweek magazine asserted if there was a turning point in Nixon's long ordeal in the wilderness, it was that moment, that great gesture of love. Every Brennan tells a moving story about his mother. His mother moved in with a sister living home after all time made it impossible to live alone. She only been there a week when he got a call from the supervisor. She said, I hate to tell you this, but your mom's been swiping things from other people. Socks, candy bars, t-shirts, nothing big except that one lady's cross is missing. Grinnick could scarcely believe this. His mom was the most honest person in the world. You know, she, she once drove 20 miles back to a store to return to the clerk extra change she had received. So next time he visited her, he gently chided her for her pilfering. He said, you got to cut it out, Mom. <laughs> Sit in the lunchroom, did, did you take the cross? She shook her head, her gray curls bouncing. Sure about that, he pressed. His mother turned away, and then she reached into her purse and pulled out a small silver cross. And she set it down on the table and stared at it. I wasn't trying to steal it. That's all the explanation she gave. Then he returned that cross over to the supervisor, apologized. He said, no, 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 no need to apologize. Your mom's a charmer. She's just trying to hang on to the things that mean the most to her. Next time Grennan came to the assisted living center, he brought his mom a small silver cross. And she stopped stealing after that. Eventually, they had to move Grennan's mom to a facility where she could receive more care. And where, of course, she charmed everyone. She even led prayers on Friday morning. And she'd forgotten almost everything else. But the prayers that came to her lips were like she'd just freshly committed to memory. And when she died, the saddest people of all were those who were in a prayer group on Friday morning. The little silver cross he gave her clutched in her hand. Her story gives new meaning to that line of the old gospel song, I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange someday for a crown. The turning point for us is Palm Sunday. It's our moment of triumph. It was a triumph because God, Jesus, decided to ignore our miserable state and act on our behalf. He chose to ignore the crowd's version of Palm Sunday and go with his. The triumph and the tragedy. They cheered Jesus on Sunday, and on Friday they hung him on a tree. But God has the last word. God took that tree, made a symbol of our salvation, from the forces of sin and death, triumph and tragedy, then triumph again. Thank God that the final triumph, the triumph over sin and death,